Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jane Kamensky, the faculty director of the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe. Welcome or welcome back to Voting Matters, Gender, Citizenship, and the Long 19th Amendment, uh, the culminating event series of our Long 19th Amendment project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I have two very small jobs as we launch into this afternoon's program. First, I want to situate this session, our fourth, centered on the landmark year of 1965 with reference to what's come before it. The Long 19th Amendment project posits that we need to understand women's citizenship in the United States in a long arc of time and across a wide swath of analytical and geographical space. Our first session considered the tangled origins of the women's rights movement in the early 19th century, including the foundational thought and activism of black women, particularly in their churches. We then moved forward to 1870 in the wake of the American Civil War with panelists who reflected on gender, race, and citizenship from multiple vantage points, including black women's clubs in the East, Cherokee Nation in the Trans-Mississippi West, and Chinese American women's lives and goals in the far Western United States. Our 1920 centennial session had the tough task of braiding all these strands and adding some more. Throughout the series thus far, we've reckoned with the relationship between growing liberty for some female Americans and the persistent and sometimes related exclusions of other Americans, uh, male and female. Our 1920 panelists reminded us that both of these narratives, the celebratory one and the reckoning, were essential and indivisible. And so today, to 1965, a year that marked the fulfillment of some of the 19th Amendment's promises, and indeed of some freedom struggles that the 19th Amendment meant not to resolve. It was also a year that inaugurated new fights and ongoing struggles around gender and citizenship in the United States. It's my second job and a genuine treat to welcome Professor Liette Gidlow, who will frame today's moment further and introduce our panelists. Gidlow was one of the 2020 Mellon Schlesinger Fellows at Radcliffe and is Associate Professor of History at Wayne State University in Detroit. You know her as the author of The Big Vote, and she is working now on a new book that discovers largely forgotten connections between the suffrage agitation of the early 20th century and the Black freedom movements of the 1950s and 1960s. It is now my pleasure to turn the virtual floor over to Professor Gidlow. Thank you, Professor Kamensky. It is a delight to be with you and this esteemed panel of guests as we take up the historical moment of 1965. The 19th Amendment, momentous as it was, left a great many questions about citizenship unresolved. It did nothing to remedy remaining inequalities between the sexes. Indeed, it left a great many women of color and poor women as disenfranchised as men in their communities, as so-called white primaries, poll taxes, erstwhile literacy tests, and threats of violence continued to block millions of citizens from the polls. Unnaturalized immigrants, including immigrants ineligible for naturalization, could not vote under any circumstances. Much of that unfinished business was taken up in the social ferment of the 1960s. Passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 marked the pinnacle of the civil rights movement as the federal government stepped in to offer meaningful protection for Southern African American voters and indeed all American voters for the first time since Reconstruction. The Black freedom and anti-war movements of the period spawned a broad rights revolution in which diverse groups pressed claims for equity and autonomy in crusades for women's rights, Chicano and Chicana rights, workers' rights, Native American rights, gay rights, disability rights, and more. 
U.S. immigration policy likewise shifted course in 1965 with passage of the Immigration and Naturalization Act, which removed national quotas and permitted greater numbers of immigrants to enter. The act also promoted family unification, leveled the field for lawful entry, and eased entry for, for foreign-born professionals, while at the same time opening the country to large-scale immigration from Asia and Africa for the first time. 50 years later, the impact of this legislation can be seen at all levels of society. Today, over 40 million foreign-born individuals live in the United States, about three quarters of whom have legal status. They and their American-born children comprise nearly a quarter of the U.S. population. Our distinguished panelists will bring these issues to bear as they explore the significance of the moment of 1965. Natalia Molina is Professor of American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Her historical work on the social construction of ethnic and racial identities explores the role that immigration policy has played in articulating, adapting, and applying a set of racial scripts to a series of racialized groups, connecting them across time and space. Dr. Molina is a member of the latest class of MacArthur Fellows. Mirna Perez is director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law. There she leads the program's research, advocacy, and litigation work nationwide. She's a graduate of Columbia Law School and the winner of many awards, including the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Excellence in Public Service from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Nicholas Stephanopoulos is professor of law at Harvard Law School, where his scholarship on election law and voting rights forges new connections between democratic theory and empirical political science. A graduate of Yale Law School, he has published widely in prestigious law reviews and the popular press, and has brought his expertise in redistricting law and gerrymandering to litigation that was argued before the Supreme Court. He's also a co-founder of Plan Score, a website for measuring partisan gerrymandering. Tamiko Brown Nagan is the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute the Daniel P.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School, and a professor of history on the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. Her scholarship on education law and policy and civil rights law and history has won wide acclaim and many awards, including the Bancroft Prize in U.S. History. In her forthcoming book, the Dean explores the life and times of Constance Baker Motley, the path-breaking attorney for the NAACP. Dean Brown Nagan is serving as the moderator of today's roundtable conversation. After the roundtable discussion, I will moderate a question and answer period involving all four speakers. We encourage those watching to use the Q&A feature on Zoom. You can submit questions at any time during the program. Since we anticipate a lot of questions, we ask that you keep them short so that we may address as many as possible. It's now my pleasure to pass the virtual floor to Dean Tomiko Brown Nagan. Thank you, uh, Liette, for that kind introduction. I'm so excited to be a part of this panel today about the landmark Voting Rights Act of 1965. The late Congressman John Lewis called the law the nation's finest hour and the crowning achievement of the civil rights movement. It was the culmination of a decades long struggle against black disfranchisement accomplished through poll taxes, literacy tests, fraud, restrictive and arbitrary registration practices and even violent repression as John Lewis well knew having been beaten by troopers with nightsticks on the Edmund Pettus Bridge during the Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March in 1965. 
The New York Times described that violent repression like this, and I'm quoting it because I think we ought to remember. People fell to the ground screaming, arms and legs flying, packs and bags skittering. Meanwhile, hoops, cheers, and racial slurs came from a crowd of white onlookers. The violence during that march, later called Bloody Sunday, gave rise to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And when he signed this bill into law on October 6, 1965, President Lyndon Baines Johnson proclaimed, today we strike away the last major shackle of the chains of oppression that had tethered Africans to America. The law promised to fulfill the black freedom struggle's central objective, political power and meaningful representation in government. And of course, this was a dream that was shared by Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans and women across all these boundaries. And for a time, the US Supreme Court seemed to support the ambition of achieving a genuine democracy on the terms that the civil rights movement had sought. But before long, it became clear that freedom under law was not enough to achieve equality in fact, as well as in theory. And that is what this panel is all about. The gap between law on the books and the on the ground experience of exercising rights, forming winning political coalitions, and then translating policy preferences into law for communities of color, women, and other disfranchised groups. Now on this panel, as Liette mentioned, are experts in law and history, practitioners and theorists who will explain why the Voting Rights Act has both a place of pride in the movement for full citizenship and why there nevertheless is and was a gap between the act's aspirations and the reality. And so I want to begin our conversation engaging this gap by putting uh, to each of the panelists this initial question. As we've learned in earlier Voting Matters programs, the 19th Amendment was a pivotal moment in the expansion of citizenship rights in the United States, yet it had significant shortcomings. Many women of color, including African American women, Native women, and immigrant women, remained disfranchised after the amendment's passage in 1920. Then, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed. So the question is, how did the Voting Rights Act of 1965 reshape citizenship? And perhaps we'll go to Nicholas first. Great. Thank you, uh, Dean Browning, for that question. Thanks also to everyone involved in putting together this wonderful event it's uh, truly a privilege to be uh, involved uh, in this. Uh, so the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 reshaped American citizenship by making members of racial minority groups, uh, in particular African Americans in the South, uh, full participants in American democracy for the first time in American history. And just so we're clear as to what the VRA did, it included a whole series of potent policies. It authorized the deployment of federal observers and registrars in the South. It banned literacy tests and moral character requirements for voting. It banned voter intimidation. And it put Southern jurisdictions under federal supervision uh, with respect to any changes in their electoral practices. This was a, a very big deal, a real intervention into uh, uh, Southern and American democracy. Uh, so thanks to these steps, African-American voter registration skyrocketed in the South in the late 1960s. Uh, you saw rates of black voter registration jumping by up to 50, 60, 70 percentage points in Southern states. Uh, and as uh, black citizens began voting in the aftermath of the VRA's enactment. Uh, we quickly also saw the election of minority preferred candidates, uh, initially in smaller numbers, and then after some crucial amendments to the VRA in 1982, in ever larger numbers. 
Uh, so the VRA really reshaped American democracy in two ways for minority citizens. Uh, first, by enfranchising them, by uh, protecting the right to vote for them. Uh, and then second, by enabling them not only to vote, but also to secure representation in legislatures and other bodies by their own preferred candidates. And those are two momentous milestones in the history of American democracy. Thank you. The first political campaign that I volunteered for was in high school for a woman named Gloria Molina. And she was the first state legislature, first LA city council member, and then first elected board of supervisors. And the possibilities uh, made possible to Gloria Molina were made possible because of uh, you know, things like the Voting Rights Act, that it opened up these opportunities. Um, so even though the Voting Rights Act was really intended for African Americans to right these historic wrongs, to uh, you know, uh, add protections to voting in the South, it also had the effect of you know spreading uh, equality in a relational way. And you know we see that with the example of Gloria Molina, uh, that the opening for her career was made possible. It, in, it by an act initially uh, imagined for African Americans. Um, even right before, while we you know, think about the Voting Rights Act in relationship to African Americans, we can do that same genealogy of disenfranchisement, of um, language barriers, of um, all the of poll intimidation, also by the Border Patrol in. Latino uh, areas, especially in states like California, Arizona, and Texas. Just right before the Voting Rights Act passed in the year before, Arizona had adopted a policy called Operation Eagle Eye, which was a program under which officials made citizenship challenges at polling sites to intimidate uh, Latinx voters. And while we are in Hispanic Heritage Month and we talk about this diversity and the many generations that certain Latinx groups have been here and that Puerto Ricans are citizens, in the end, once they were at the poll, they were all still seen as foreigners. So, um, you know, these are the ways that we can think about how by expanding the rights for one group that we all benefit. Great. Thank you, Professor Molina. And Myrna Perez. Uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. I'm Mirna Perez. I'm the director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. I'm also an adjunct of election law at Columbia Law School. Um, I completely agree with my panelists, but I think we're missing one really important point, and that is the VRA as a moralizing force, the VRA as a way of setting norms and basics, because uh, the VRA, in my mind, is a tangible representation of the promise this country made via the 15th Amendment that when you step into the ballot box, you are going to be free from racial discrimination in voting. And that didn't just happen. Like, just as the dean mentioned that all of the hard work that was done by John Lewis and those brave, brave folks, this is an example in which people won. Like, people fighting, people uh, sacrificing, people moving. Um, we're able to move a institutional body that doesn't tend to be very responsive to the public. And I think that that is incredibly important when you think about the history of the 15th Amendment. Like the 15th Amendment on its terms is extraordinarily broad. And then Congress passed uh, a numerous uh, amount of uh, enabling legislation. I think there were 17 acts that were passed by Congress right after the 15th Amendment was done to try and actualize um, the promise of the 15th Amendment, and then the courts came in and shut them back through Cruikshank, through Reese, through other decisions. And so for years, we had Congress being responsive to a problem, the court limiting it, and here's a chance where the people were able to overcome um, the institutional heft of the court um, limiting access. So I think, yes, the VRA has reshaped citizenship by, by making sure that our democracy is more robust and participatory and inclusive. But I also think um, it signaled that sometimes mobilizing and winning hearts and minds and uh, convincing people in power by people who don't have power um, that 
we need to have a more robust and participatory democracy. And I think I can't think of any example that better proves that point than the VRA. Thank you so much for that, uh, for those answers. Uh, and in particular for placing uh, the achievement of the Voting Rights Act within that movement context uh, and uh, for emphasizing its, its broad reach. Um, and the fact, as we started off with, uh, that the Voting Rights Act yielded representation um, for the first time in many places since Reconstruction. Okay, so all of that sounds great. Uh, the next question is, so what are the limitations of the vision of political empowerment that's embedded in the Voting Rights Act? Um, what is the gap? And so let's go uh, through a round robin again with uh, Nicholas, if you want to start. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention a couple major limitations that I see to the Voting Rights Act vision. Uh, one is that it's always neglected uh, substantive policy representation for minority voters. Uh, the, the focus of VRA activity has always been protecting the right to vote itself and enabling minority preferred candidates to win office. Uh, there's been much less attention paid to what these minority preferred candidates are able to do once they're in office. Uh, whether they're actually able to enact policies that genuinely advance minority uh, needs and interests. And all too often, they're not able to do so because they hold only a few legislative seats and they're outvoted by their uh, partisan or ideological adversaries. And in that, in that scenario of limited substantive representation for minority voters, the VRA says very little. Uh, the other limitation that I'd mention is that the VRA has tended to accept as a given the basic American electoral model of winner take all, single member, geographically bounded districts. Uh, these are the remedies that plaintiffs win when they challenge existing district maps. Uh, new districts with somewhat different boundaries that are somewhat more likely to elect minority preferred candidates. Um, but these are a fundamentally suboptimal policy for many minority groups, uh, especially for geographically dispersed minority groups, uh, like Latinos tend to be and like Asian Americans tend to be. Uh, there are other policies out there, multi-member districts with some form of proportional representation that, uh, in my view, do a better job of providing descriptive and substantive representation for minority voters, uh, and crucially, also being able to provide uh, adequate representation to more geographically dispersed minority voters. Um, so I think that that focus on uh, the American uh, classic model is another limit of the, the VRA. Great, thank you. Professor Molina? There's a wonderful op-ed in the New York Times today entitled Stop Othering Latinos uh, by Gerardo Cadava, who's at uh, Northwestern University. And he also brings up the point of just who do we imagine as these voters? Who do we imagine as the people that we need to protect? And he uh, mentions a quote by President Trump, who was recently in a rally, rally in New Mexico, and he says, who do you like more, the country or the Hispanics, as though they were mutually exclusive? And I would say that, um, you know, this isn't just a contemporary issue, but this we could think about this going back to the Voting Rights Act. Yes, uh, the Voting Rights Act did open opportunities for Latinos, but there was actually a lag, including the opportunities that made things like Gloria Molina's uh, political career possible. And that was that um, it wasn't until 1975 there was an extension added to the Voting Rights Act to uh, explicitly bring um, uh, discrimination, to try to stop discrimination towards Latinos around language, around uh, making sure that, uh, you know, that we would have bi uh, bilingual ballots. So this is uh, the, the 1975 extension is signed by President Gerald Ford, who is a Republican, who extended uh, discrimination around 
so so called language minorities. So here we're talking about Latinx, and specifically they had in mind at that time Texas, California, Puerto Ricans, but also Native Americans, also Asian Americans, also um, Alaskans, Hawaiians, who for many years had also continued to experience uh, voting discrimination in different ways. And so you know we need to think about both what kinds of um, imagining who is our electorate in broad ways, but also in specific ways that meet and deal with the kind of limitations and challenges their communities may be facing. Thank you. Uh, so I would just like to jump a little bit on what Professor Molina said. I mean, certainly uh, language minorities have very limited uh, assistance under the uh, VRA. There's only four. Um, that uh, are qualified, notwithstanding the fact that our dynamics in our country is changing and there are different minority groups with different language needs coming up. But one of the things that I want to be really mindful of, especially since we're talking about uh, having a new VRA in the new, uh, uh, you know, in the new session, is that even with all of its limitations, even with the ways in which it is imperfect and doesn't go far enough, it still got struck down by a court notwithstanding lots and lots of records, lots and lots of evidence, and lots and lots of courts saying it was constitutional and permissible. So um, we need to be aware of the fact that we live in a reality where uh, the courts are going to impose limits, the courts are going to demand certain standards of proof, the courts are going to have their own ideas about what is proper and what's not proper. Um, and we need to be very, very careful about how much work we want one act to be able to do and how closely that work is able to tie, be tied to its originating um, animating concern, which was the 15th Amendment and looking at the nexus between racial discrimination and elections. Um, and I, I do worry, because uh, I see we, I think we see this all the time. We, especially like as a litigator, we see lots and lots and lots of cases out there where folks are trying to shoehorn whatever problem they have into a VRA claim or a VRA case because there's so much jurisprudence built up around it. And then we end up losing those cases. And then the viability of the VRA is at risk, right? Where we might lose even more. And so I, I, it's not that I disagree that it is not going to solve all of the representation problems, nor is it gonna solve all of the problems of inequality or even inequality in the political system. But I do think we need to make a real world assessment about what we can justify under an original understanding of what the 15th Amendment is supposed to do. And can we sell that vision to the courts? Because otherwise, we are just setting up um, the VRA to fail. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that is something that is sometimes lost when people are lodging critiques about what it can do. Like we live in, a, in an environment where we need to be concerned about what the standard of review is like and what the judiciary is going to look like and what we'll be able to get support for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that's very important. And I want to ask uh, uh, um, you to talk more about the cases that you're referring to in just a moment. Um, but I want to first go back to um, the, the construct, the black-white dichotomy that Professor Molina was um, talking about and uh, how much it was stretched under the Voting Rights Act. Um, and in particular, I want you to talk about that in relation to the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, um, which um, made it possible for there to be uh, a lot of uh, immigration from Asian and African countries. And so the question is, to what extent did um, post-1965 immigration from these areas reshape the electorate and promote uh, participation in a multiracial, multi-ethnic electorate in the way that I believe um, you're getting at we should be pursuing? Thank you for that question, Dean. Uh, I think the first thing is to step back and see how we got to that moment of the Voting, Voting Rights Act uh, via Latino history and see that for Latinos, they were not, again, imagined in terms of uh, when this, the Voting Rights Act was being constructed uh, in, in that history. 
And you know, when, when Latinos are admitted into the U.S. as citizens, at least for Mexican Americans in 1848, for Mexicans living on these U.S. territories, this is a time when citizenship is only extended to whites, not blacks who are slaves, many of whom are slaves, uh, not Asians, uh, m many of whom are Chinese at this time, and definitely not a uh, Native Americans, um, indigenous peoples. And so it's this constant battle to be even recognized as citizens. And you have key court cases. Uh, you have key institutions like the census in 1930 that legislates them as a race of their own. And when you think of the key landmark, um, so you know, part of it is that kind of legal buildup. Um, part of it is the on the ground practices like uh, um, you know, Professor Stephanopoulos was talking about in terms of all the discrimination, and you see that in the Southwest uh, in terms of poll taxes, literacy tests, uh, vigilante violence, um, lynchings, uh, all, all these different things. Um, but then you also, um, when we think about the Civil Rights Act or Civil Rights Movement for uh, Chicanos, much of them and, you know, and Latinx groups, much of them is uh, you know, around like immigrant rights. And so there's this narrative where we're not really including them. Add to that, now you have 1965. Uh, the 1965 Immigration Act, on the surface, many people might say, oh, that sounds a lot like the Voting Rights Act, right? It, it's doing a lot of that same work. It's this promise of equality. It's this language of equality. There was something unequal, uh, the way that quotas worked, starting in 1924, and now we've passed something, the 1965 Immigration Act, and that will make it equal. The problem is that like the Voting Rights Act, it doesn't work to make groups e equal. It gives, um, quote, a, you know, an equal number of, of immigration slots of, of you know, numerical ceiling to, you know, to countries of very different sizes. On top of that, we know that we've already been having uh, Mexican immigration in part because they're uh, you know, so close to the United States, they border the United States, but also in part because we've had a guest worker program, the Bracero program from 1942 to 1964 that issues four million contracts uh, to Mexican laborers and that those laborers are also bringing their families. And so there's an undocumented stream. Uh, when that immigration, that immigration ceiling is just whittled down, it's like this cutting off a faucet. And so you continue to see undocumented immigration and there's no way to, there's no remedy for it. Uh, there's no discussion of it, you know, not until you know, 1986 under Ronald Reagan with IRCA. And so we end up having a discussion of citizenship and rights and voting for the most part, uh, for certain groups, um, you know, mainly African Americans, and then we have this re-racializing of Latinx immigrants, you know, just regardless of um, immigration or generation here, as undocumented, um, as forever foreigners, and you know, as well as you know, not really part of this conversation. And so you continue to see this tension throughout. Mm, thank you so much for that. Um such rich history and, and theory and really exposing um, the limitations of all of these legal structures. And so let me ask this question then, how effective have anti-discrimination lawsuits been over time in securing political empowerment for communities of color um, and for uh, you know, women uh, as a part of those communities of color? Um, maybe, uh, Nicholas, you can uh, start us off here. Uh, sure. Um, so, you know, the, the VRA makes no explicit reference to sex or to gender. Uh, and so there's, there's no possibility of bringing uh, an overtly gender-based claim under the Voting Rights Act. Um, Nevertheless, of course, uh, uh, Black, Latino, Asian American women have benefited enormously from the Voting Rights Act in that they've uh, also secured the franchise. They've also secured the uh, election of many of their preferred candidates uh, to office. Um, I'll, I'll note on the issue of uh, female political power how much work remains to be done despite the, the VRA. Uh, I've recently done some empirical research where I've looked at issues where men and women disagree. Uh, what is the likelihood of uh, uh, one or another group's views being enacted as a matter of policy? 
it turns out that on those issues where there's uh, gender-based disagreement, the greater the female support for a given policy position, the less likely that policy is to be enacted over the next uh, few years. So uh, when it comes to uh, substantive policy representation for women in today's political system, there's, uh, there's a lot of work left to be done, notwithstanding advances like the, the VRA. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, Mirna, would you like to speak to the question of um, how effective lawsuits have been since the Voting Rights Act and trying to um, uh, achieve political power for the people who uh, are, uh, were supposed to benefit from it? Um, I, I think it's indisputable that over time they have uh, been successful in bringing more people in. I think if one were to take a snapshot of what's happening right now, it would be very mixed. Some of it is for the reason that I told you, where people are trying to stretch the Voting Rights Act too far to try and cover things that some people would find questionable that were actually implicating Voting Rights Act issues. Um, uh, but I also think that one thing that needs to be remembered, and this is going to sound very funny coming from a litigator, is that we cannot let or expect the courts to be able to be the, the final word on something as important as whether or not we have a robust and participatory democracy. That is something that we need to win in the streets every day, right? That is something uh, that is a case we need to be making, because in my mind, all of this voter suppression, all of this stuff about the VRA, this comes down to power and to anxiety over the browning of America and people being nervous that they have a position of power that they may lose if other people enjoy free, fair access to the ballot box. And I think you see it everywhere. Like, uh, you know, my home state is Texas. I, wanna, I was one of the litigators in the Texas photo ID case. Uh, the photo ID law was not passed in large part because people presumed that African-Americans didn't have the kind of IDs. It was because they thought Latinos didn't have the kind of IDs. And they were seeing the, the growth in the Latino population, the fact that Latinos were changing who they associated with politically. We see that in the case that I just won a couple of hours ago in Harris County, where we challenged in state court uh, Governor Abbott's decision to limit where the ballot, uh, where ballots could be returned in terms of locations. Um, Harris County is one of the most diverse state, uh, jurisdictions in the entire country. It is certainly the most diverse in, um, in Texas. And as Latinos especially uh, become uh, more uh, competable, like where people can compete for them as opposed to, as opposed to the, their history uh, of maybe when I was growing up of being aligned with one particular party, we're going to see greater efforts to try and suppress them. I think we also see it very much with the Asian community, which is just in, uh, experiencing a rapid growth. People tend to leave people alone when they don't think that they're going to be politically powerful. It's as they are starting to be a threat that you see the backlash and you see the politicians going in, trying to manipulate the rules of the game so that they have a job security plan. Mm -hmm. so we need to be mindful of having a VRA and having laws and having jurisprudence that account for changes in demographics and for growth, rather than assuming that a particular model is static. Mm -hmm. Very good. So let's talk about um, the promise of uh, women and women of color as a, a part of the US electorate. The Center for American Progress in 2019 called women of color a collective powerhouse in the US electorate. And so I want us to talk about um, the extent to which women of color in particular are realizing the promise of uh, political participation, representation, political leadership as a result, uh, not only of the Voting Rights Act, but of this activism uh, at the state and local level in the way that Mirna was referring to. Natalia, would you like to speak to that? Yes, um, thank you. Um, and congratulations, Mirna. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, 
I, yeah, I want to just follow up on Midna's point about the backlash and the way that she talked about it in relationship to, you know, fighting access to the ballot box um, and as minorities grow in power. And I think actually um, my my answer is more geared to uh, the limits of political empowerment, because one of the ways that we've seen in terms of that that backlash to the Browning of America is the way that women. Uh, in particular, can be used to stir up fears, to stir up that backlash. Uh, there, you know, one key example of that is in California in 1994 with Proposition 187, where you know uh, you have Kathleen Brown um, and Pete Wilson running for governor, and California is going through an economic recession. And it's you know not just immigration that there's a backlash towards immigration but particularly a growing population of immigrants. Um, and Proposition 187 is designed to, uh, to uh, stop uh, public services towards undocumented immigrants, um, particularly, you know, what's mentioned in the campaign as uh, education and public services uh, like healthcare. And so this was an act that, again, not in its wording, but its intent was directed towards Latinx, and was directed towards women. Uh, it was okay to have work uh, Mexican immigrants come back and forth uh, and do that labor like in guest worker programs, but not if they were gonna stay. Um, and so it, it, there's that kind of constant uh, uh, way in which women are mobilized as that fear, and yet we, we or to stoke that fear, and yet we continue to ignore that. There's just uh, recently a new documentary on Proposition 187 that just aired this week on PBS, or last week, and it's wonderful, and I highly recommend it. But it also doesn't really take the heart to heart the way that uh, gender and using women as symbols uh, to uh, stoke our fears about immigrants uh, keeps coming up. And that ends up you know, having these ripple effects in terms of how we are able to imagine Latinx as part of you know, our wider community. Mm -hmm. That's such an important issue to talk about. And we have to move to uh, audience uh, Q&A. Um, at the same time, I do think we, uh, we're at a moment now in particular where um, we need to think about that possibility, um, the idea of women and women of color as um, poised to capture the, uh, the electorate, to define issues through social movements, um, to win uh, elective office. Um, let's talk about, hopefully in the Q&A, uh, things like the meaning of uh, Kamala Harris and Stacey Abrams and so uh, Nancy Pelosi being Speaker of the House, these are um, moments and people, individual successes that we have to try to reconcile with all of the, the, the richness that um, Natalia and Mirna are bringing to this conversation. Um, and I hope we'll be able to do that in q and I'll turn it over to Lett to uh, take us to some audience questions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dean, and thank you to all our panelists. Uh, the first question comes for Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas, there is a, a question about uh, how are gains in voting rights for individuals, such as those secured through the Voting Rights Act, blunted or dissipated through other systemic processes such as gerrymandering? Uh, thanks a lot. They are unfortunately dramatically uh, undermined uh, through some of those sorts of, of devious efforts uh, like gerrymandering. If you think about uh, the influence of an individual or a group on the political process, uh, it's a product of, of multiple factors. Uh, there needs to be the, the vote itself, but then you need to have uh, ways of aggregating votes that enable uh, adequate representation for a group in uh, the legislature. And then you need sufficient numbers in the legislature to actually uh, pass laws, do things that are beneficial to the needs and interests of the group. And there can be pushback, there can be subversion at any step along that chain. Uh, even if uh, uh, Black and Latino and, and other minority voters have the right to vote, well, those gains can be undermined by uh, uh, cracking or packing minority voters and diminishing their legislative uh, representation. 
even if they have sufficient legislative representation, they can just be outvoted in the legislature by a bigger opposing bloc. So unfortunately, the, the struggle goes on and on. There aren't silver bullets. It's not like the right to vote uh, is a panacea that uh, results in adequate political power for a group. Um, you know, that, that fight just has to continue. Uh, Professor Peters, would you like to weigh in on that question, how gerrymandering and other forms of um, tinkering with election mechanics can infringe upon the rights that are supposed to be protected by the Voting Rights Act? I, I think that it, it's obvious that it does, but I also think that people live in an ecosystem and we can blame gerrymandering for uh, blunting people's actualization politically, but we can also blame an education system. We can blame uh, a nutrition system. We can blame a transportation system. I, I, I think part of what we need to uh, do as a country is look at the way that inequality and racism is baked in to so many of our systems that feed into what does it mean to have self-representation? What does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to have a meaningful voice and to be able to have influence over those legislators that decide incredibly intimate aspects of your life, ranging from where your kids go to school to what kind of food do you put in your body, to what kind of air you breathe. Um, and certainly uh, redistricting is one obvious one because it looks like it's confined to the electoral sphere, but even the Voting Rights Act, um, or certainly uh, the way Congress's interpretation of the Voting Rights Act and the different kind of factors that courts are supposed to consider um, have a more holistic approach because uh, it's not going to be the case that perfect gerrymander or perfect redistricting or perfectly fair redistricting and perfectly fair voting is still going to bring about an a, a equality. Um, and, and that is, again, what I'm beseeching all of the folks who are listening to this to be looking at the ways in which our systems of power are built upon systems that have not brought everybody in. And I think one of the big pieces that gets missing when we're talking about the role of women is that voter suppression is our barriers to the ballot box are always going to hit hardest among those who have the fewer margin, the fewest margins. By definition, it's going to hit hardest those that are the most marginalized, the people that can't stand in line for a long time because they have childcare, the people that are worried about getting fired if uh, they have to spend their whole day going to different government offices so that they can get an ID. And to the extent to which the discrimination in our world is intersectional and the and, and the people in that Venn diagram are going to be women and women of color, um, you better believe that they're going to be feeling it more. You better believe that they're going to be feeling it more irrespective of what the barrier is going to be because over time we have created a system whereby uh, women and women of color are going to be more on the margins. Thank you. Uh, Professor Molina, I wonder, I wonder if you could uh, talk to us about the sometimes forgotten history of the enfranchisement of people who had not attained formal citizenship in the 19th century, the um, widespread availability of so-called alien suffrage, that is, people who had taken out first papers but had not completed the naturalization process. And I wonder if um, that can lead us to some thoughts about uh, representation in the political system for people who don't have legal status. And can you say a little bit more about, I, I think you were tracing a certain genealogy there. Can you tell me a little bit more about your thinking on that? Um, so I'm thinking about the, the widespread practice of so-called alien suffrage from the 19th century, where in 31 states, people who had started the naturalization process but had not completed it yet um, ex had the ability to exercise the right to vote and, in fact, did in, in broad numbers. By the 1920s, uh, every state requires a person to be a citizen in order to cast a ballot. And yet we do have this legacy of people who don't have legal status as citizens uh, being able to participate in electoral politics more broadly. I wonder if 
Um, you can speak to the ways that people who lack legal status might be better represented in the political process. I think uh, one, I would backtrack a little bit and go back to a little bit about what uh, Midna Bettis was saying in terms of we need to look at the ways in which uh, these kinds of systems are built already on these unequal systems. And so you know, even when people are eligible for naturalization, and we see this you know, decade after decade in the you know, 20th century, they're not necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily applying for citizenship. And why is this? And it's because voting is, you know, voting and citizenship is, is that one system, as Midna was saying. But then there are those other systems, right, where people can live. Um, so you even have people like Edward Roybal, who's the first Mexican-American elected city councilman in Los Angeles um, in the post-World War period, who finally elected uh, the, the first Mexican in, you know, since uh, Los Angeles was part of Mexico, and yet can't buy a home in his own district. Um, you, uh, you have people that, you know, are, you know, even in somewhere like California and Los Angeles that people think about as more progressive, you know, segregated schools, not being able to join unions, um, deportation camps set up in cities, not just in like some obscure, you know, some, you know, uh, farm where people aren't watching, you know, at Dodger Stadium, this is where, you know, these kinds of uh, things were set up in 1954 in Operation Gatekeeper. And so within that system, you also see that people are not, um, are not buying for citizenship, buying for naturalization. Um, in terms of then how we think about how those practices might be extended to them, sometimes it's not in necessarily the things that we would think about in voting, but things like can I get a driver's license so I can drive to work legally and not be, you know, if I'm pulled over, not be deported? Can I fight for um, housing and housing rights? Can I fight for the things that will make my everyday life meaningful and fulfilling? And then what you see also is the way that these families are often living um, uh, as mixed status families. So that even if you empower some members of the community, like through something like uh, the Deferred um, Action um, you know, uh, DACA, you also have other members of the family that are not eligible for that, such as parents or other siblings, and um, are still very vulnerable. And so you also see the ways that uh, Latinx populations hesitate to either get those kinds of rights, whether it be through DACA, whether it be through the Affordable Care Act, even if they're eligible, because it still brings a spotlight um, to their family and it still means submitting their personal information to the government. So it's really having to think about a, a family's and a community's whole, life, um, whole lives if we want to try to encourage that kind of participation. Thank you so much. Great. So this question is uh, for Dean Brown Nagan. I wonder if you might reflect upon the ways that this moment of racial reckoning differs from that of the 1960s. Um, what resources are available to uh, people working for uh, broader rights and freedoms today that were not available to uh, many of the people who pursued those causes in the 1960s? Well, in many ways, thank you for the question. Uh, in many ways, it's it's just a different world because of the the, the reasons for the reasons that um, we've been talking about on this panel. The Voting Rights Act uh, enfranchised people who had not been able to vote before, and the point that Myrna was making about it being a moralizing force is really important. So. Um, uh, you know, the Voting Rights Act and all of the activism of the 1960s um, had an afterlife um, that we are seeing expressed today um, with, uh, you know, young people, uh, including women, often women, uh, leading movements and defining issues. Think about Black Lives Matter. Think about the push uh, for, you um, uh, status for dreamers and other undocumented people. Um, think about uh, the way in which people like uh, Stacey Abrams in her campaign for governor uh, inspired new voters um, and a part of the way in which Abrams and others 
uh, are inspiring new voters and activism is through uh, social media. Um, and uh, so, you know, even as we um, talk about on this panel, you know, continuing uh, voter suppression um, and all of the nuances um, in uh, you know, voting and participation, uh, the silences, uh, the things that the law cannot do. Um, when I compare this period to the period of the 1960s, um, I, I have a sense of hope. I have a sense of possibility. Um, I am uh, heartened by the extent to which women and women of color are providing margins of victory in federal, state, and local elections. I'm heartened by um, the fact that uh, although you know, the disadvantages associated with, with voting and political activism certainly fall on women. They're standing in those lines. Uh, they're getting, uh, you know, they're leading uh, voter registration efforts. And so, um, you know, we have come an incredibly long way uh, from where we were in the 1960s. Uh, and, and I have a sense of, of hope and, and great possibility um, about um, you know the the enthusiasm, uh, the activism that I'm seeing these days. It's an outgrowth of of uh, promises unfulfilled during the 1960s, including around police brutality. Thank you so much. We have time for one final question, uh, which I hope that each panelist is able to weigh in on. Uh, perhaps uh, Dean Brown, and you can start us off. What kinds of provisions should a new Voting Rights Act or new Immigration Act uh, include in order to effectively empower uh, people in, who are disenfranchised and marginalized in this political moment? Is there a, something in particular that you would like to see in either voting rights or immigration reform legislation? Mm. Well, you know, I will. I, I was speaking for quite a long time, so I'm going to let my co-panelists uh, speak. I would say, just very briefly, when I think about what is needed, I think about uh, building movements uh, in local uh, communities uh, at the state level, building uh, durable uh, coalitions. I actually don't think so much about um, uh, the legal architecture of change. Of course, I would like to see. Uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act uh, enacted. Um, it is meant to essentially uh, take us to the status quo ante before the courts um, uh, uh, took away um, preclearance in Shelby County versus Holder. Uh, but mostly, I, I don't actually think about uh, the legal architecture. I think about the great promise, as I was saying, of organizing uh, on the ground, mobilizing voters, harnessing that energy in ideas about what is needed for a holistic um, uh, vision of equality to be realized. Thank you. Professor Molina, is there something you would add? The changes that I would think uh, that we would need are not necessarily encompassed in the Voting Rights Act, but are very much hand in hand with them. And uh, it does go back to the question that you posed, Professor Gidlow, in terms of you know, what are the ways that we can see and uh, that we might think about empowerment for, you know, for, for groups that aren't citizens. And one of them, you know, somebody, one big vision would be to think about, you know, regardless of how, um, you know, people came to this country to offer a path to citizenship. You know, we did it in 1986, but in a very limited way. Another way that would be more limited was to think if people are here and working and are seen as essential workers, how can they simultaneously be seen as deportable, um, as illegal, if they are essential? And in that case, what do they need to live their lives in terms, you know, from everything from driver's license to access to services to um, uh, empowerment, even at the local level, from, you know, which certain cities do from school boards to city council elections. So how can we give people a voice if they are members of our community? Thank you so much. Professor Perez. Um, I don't want very many people monkeying around with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I think uh, uh, 
we got a very clear message from the court that uh, they're going to be looking at it in a really exacting way. They're going to demand a really high uh, burden of proof. Um, I think that there are uh, some very challenging political factors we need to look with. So uh, I'm not really in the business of asking what I would do if I were holding the pin, but instead looking at what can I actually do. So um, what I would encourage folks to be supportive of um, is looking at the For the People Act, also known as HR1, which was the first, um, it's called HR1 because it was the first uh, numbered bill by um, the last Congress. And it took on a whole number of issues that uh, have been disenfranchising people in the past. And I think um, some of those things include like deceptive practices, voter intimidation, uh, felony disenfranchisement, the failure for all of us to have automatic voter registration or election day registration. I think that is the place where um, we dream big and where we, uh, we look for where we can have, uh, have impact. And I think the, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act uh, needs to stay uh, pretty close to where where it is now for a lot of different reasons, including the judiciary and the political operating environment. Thank you, Professor Stephanopoulos. Right. So, uh, stepping away from the current uh, constricting legal environment, uh, here are some very aspirational changes that I would like to see eventually to the VRA. Maybe not right now. Uh, one institute some kind of preclearance review for all parts of the country. Uh, you know, measures that uh, the disadvantage uh, uh, minority voters can be passed by any jurisdiction, not just by a few targeted jurisdictions in the South, let's say. Uh, two, include in the statute uh, an actual standard for uh, uh, how to think about restrictions on voting itself. Um, that's something the, the statute doesn't currently address. It would be great if the law said outright, for example, that voting restrictions that unjustifiably impose disparate racial impacts are illegal. Um, and then number three, I would love to see authorization in the statute itself for more unconventional, more potent remedies, uh, which I've mentioned before. Uh, measures that would allow dispersed minority groups to win representation and measures that would uh, negate the unfortunate trade-off that often exists uh, between descriptive and substantive representation for minority voters. So that's just a, a, an aspirational snapshot of uh, change I'd like to see at some point uh, to the law. Thank you so much. This concludes our program today. I want to say thank you again to our panelists for your thoughtful presentations and perspectives. And I also want to thank our audience for terrific questions. Many thanks as well to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, whose support has made this conference and Radcliffe's multi-year exploration of gender and voting rights possible. I hope you'll be able to participate in future Radcliffe virtual programs, including the continuation of our virtual conference, Voting Matters, Gender, Citizenship, and the Long 19th Amendment. A full list of the remaining conference sessions will appear on your screen momentarily and can also be found on Radcliffe's website, radcliffe.harvard.edu. Finally, I hope you will be able to visit the Long 19th Amendment online portal, which can also be accessed through the Radcliffe website. The portal is an open access digital platform that includes a fascinating digital exhibition titled Seeing Citizens, Picturing American Women's Fight for the Vote. Thank you again for joining us today and take care.